Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth Ranieris, and I'm the founding director of the Notre Dame IBM Technology Ethics Lab. Along with my colleague, Mark McKenna, director of the Notre Dame Technology Ethics Center, I'm very happy to welcome you to the second Tech Talk in our spring speaker series. Our series focuses on the role of technology in promoting myths and disinformation, the ethical problems involved, and the technical, legal, and institutional responses best suited to our modern challenges. These are obviously enormously important questions right now, and we are grateful to have a world-class group of experts lined up to explore them, including academics, practitioners, and activists facing these challenges from a variety of different perspectives. In our first talk, we are fortunate to have Dr. Joan Donovan, Research Director of the Scharenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, kick things off with an academic perspective. If you missed it, you can watch the recording at think.nd.edu or on ThinkND's YouTube channel. Today, we are joined by two industry insiders turned activists, our distinguished guests, Ifeoma Zoma and Roger McNamee. Fioma Zoma is the founder and principal of Earthseed, a consulting firm supporting individuals, organizations, and companies on issues of tech accountability, public policy, health misinformation, and related communications. She's a tech policy expert with experience leading global public policy partnerships, public policy-related content safety development, and federal, state, and international policymaker engagement, including at Facebook, Google, and most recently at Pinterest. Her work has been widely cited by the WHO, New York Times, Washington Post, and many others. She's also working on some critical new legislative reforms to help tech workers, something I know we'll dive deeper into in the course of our conversation. Roger McNamee is a longtime Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley venture capitalist turned activist. Roger was a mentor to Mark Zuckerberg, an early Facebook investor, as detailed in his book, Zucked, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe. He's now a member of the Real Facebook Oversight Board, an international ad hoc cadre of activists and academics convened by the British investigative journalist, Carol Codwallader, to draw awareness to the dangers of Facebook. Through his speaking and writing, as featured in NPR, the New York Times, The Guardian, TED, Time, and many other outlets, Roger hopes to raise consciousness about responsible practices that he believes tech companies should adopt, as well as the need for regulation. In terms of the structure for today, I'm going to begin by leading a short panel discussion featuring our speakers for about 30 minutes. After that, we will turn to an audience Q&A. So please feel free to submit your questions if you haven't already. There will be a link to submit your questions in the chat. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. If Ilma and Roger, thanks very much for being here. We are so honored to have you share your perspectives with us today. So to start us off, this session is entitled, What Do We Value? the ethics of tech accountability. So I'd like to begin by asking you about values. Roger, what do you think are the values that contributed to the proliferation of myths and disinformation on the platforms? And what values do you think we can adopt to combat the problem? In the past, you've alluded to a conflict between efficiency versus enlightenment values. Can you please also say more about that? So Elizabeth, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be part of this series and thank you to Notre Dame for, for hosting it. But a huge, huge thank you from me because uh, my co-panelist, Ifoma, is like one of my heroes. And so I hope everyone will follow her lead. She's one of the most inspirational people I've ever encountered. So the issue that you're raising, I think is really important because if you want to have a conversation about ethics in technology, I think one of the starting places to recognize is that there's actually a conflict of value systems. That engineering as a discipline tends to have a, a value system which places efficiency at the top of the stack. And if you think about it, if you're making a small motor or a large motor or any kind of basic operational system, efficiency really does matter. But when a software system reaches nation scale, as would be the case for any of Google's products or Facebook's products. There comes a conflict because of if you continue to prioritize efficiency over everything else, you're going to come into conflict with Western democracies where the enlightenment values of self-determination and democracy itself are in fact optimized for something very different. They are, they are inefficient by design because that is what personal choice and the ability to express yourself in democracy are all about. 
And so this conflict between efficiency and democracy, I think is, is going to be incredibly hard to solve until we get everybody around a table acknowledging that that is the source of the problem. Thanks, Roger. We'll be touching on scale again uh, as we proceed with the conversation. Uh, turning to Thelma, in your time at the platforms, you've described an obsession with growth above all else, including health and safety. What values apart from growth should be driving decisions about content? And is there also a question or conflict between whose perspectives or whose values we're prioritizing? And we welcome any examples from direct experience. Yeah, first, thank you so much for having us today. Um, I'm so happy to be here with Roger and with you and to be having this conversation because I, I think that there hasn't been a lack of values in these companies. It's just been values that have been focused entirely on making money and on growing the platform regardless of who is harmed and the people in those buckets of harm are often women, are often people of color. They're often the same folks that the companies and the lived experience of working at the companies are devaluing the most. When you look at who is leading teams, whether it's an engineering team or a sales team, those folks and their values are what are reflected in the product. So if you have teams that are run by people who are sympathetic to white supremacy, guess what you're going to have in the product? You're going to have uh, white supremacists who are on the platforms, who are, not, uh, who are not curtailed. Their behavior is going to keep other folks from being able to speak freely. Uh, one of the things that I brought up, I remember getting into arguments. I've always been a shit starter, excuse my language. And so I remember getting into arguments uh, at Google early on in my career. Uh, at Facebook for certain, um, and then also at Pinterest about how uh, pointing to freedom of speech as the reason for not addressing safety and not addressing particularly harmful content on the platforms to me was always a smoke screen because if people aren't safe on a platform, they're not going to be able to speak freely. So what you're actually doing is creating a safe space for certain folks and then driving everyone else off the platform. Um, and if you, if you think about that and the way that that works, it's actually in conflict with the value of growth. And so I, I don't think that you have to completely remove the business case from making the case for ethics and ethics in the way that the platforms are run. But unfortunately, um, I, I, Roger gave the engineering example and the way that engineering values are often set up. I see the exact same thing with sales teams and with marketing teams. And when you remember that these companies are 50-50 engineering and business side, when you have two sides that are valuing money and valuing growth at the cost of actual human beings, it's no surprise we are where we are. Lots to unpack there, <laughs> thank you. Um, so in our last Tech Talk featuring Harvard's Joan Donovan, we actually talked a lot about the ethics of scale and you may have seen her recent piece in the Harvard Business Review around how a lot of this does come down to scale. Um, in each of your views, what role does scale play in the mis and disinformation problem? And what does that mean for our existing and our proposed solutions to the problem? For example, what does it mean for something like the Facebook Oversight Board? Um, maybe Roger, you could take this one first and also maybe tell us a bit more about the real Facebook Oversight Board and their work. So one of the problems that I think those of us in the activism world have faced is that consumers really like a lot of what they get from these platforms. They like the, the convenience, they like the, uh, the dopamine hits from a lot of the, of the products. And so one of the challenges has been to make clear the point that, uh, that Ifoma just made about the business model. So all of this really revolves around a business model that as it has scaled, has come into conflict 
with very basic elements of how our societies work, how our governments work, how our social contract works, how our public spaces work. And when you get to global scale, the impact of this can undermine entire countries, as we saw, you know, first in Sri Lanka, then in Myanmar, you've seen it in Cambodia, you've seen it in, in the Philippines, and then it came to Europe with Brexit, then the United States with Trump, then uh, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil. And you've seen this now, such that in Ireland, just this past weekend, there were demonstrations, basically QAnon demonstrations, um, and then somebody set off a bomb at a clinic in uh, the Netherlands uh, this morning, their time. And so all of this is, is interrelated. The real Facebook Oversight Board was created by Carol Cadwallader, the journalist at The Guardian in the UK, explicitly because Facebook had crafted something it called the Oversight Board that notionally was going to be the fix for all of the ills of the platform. And as I looked at it, the problem with the Oversight Board starts with the name. The charter of this is very legalistic and it looks at individual cases. So was someone taken off the platform appropriately? Was a uh, specific post taken down correctly? Which means it's more like a complaint board than it is like an oversight board. And it was designed to work over a period of decades. And Carol's view was that we were facing an urgent crisis going into the US election in 2020, where Facebook played a unique role in amplifying COVID disinformation. And as we got close to the election, the stop the steal disinformation. It also played a unique role in radicalizing people into QAnon, where its own research said that 64% of the time when someone joins an extremist group on Facebook, they do so explicitly because of a Facebook recommendation. And given that they later admitted that there were at least 3 million members of Facebook pages and Facebook groups devoted to QAnon, that meant that Facebook was potentially responsible for radicalizing 2 million people. And so when you see thousands of people dying of COVID, convinced that COVID's a hoax, and tens of thousands of people attacking the US Capitol on January 6th, with no prior history of extremism, they're absolutely convinced that the election has been misdecided. Uh, what you're looking at was a very urgent thing. And, and the goal of this was to simply call attention in any way we could by bringing together a group of activists who had focused on Facebook for a long time. And to put it bluntly, this is a very small response to a very large problem, but every little bit helps. And, you know, I think uh, as we look at it, there is clearly a much greater awareness of the issues. And post January 6th, I think the US Congress at least is beginning to recognize its absolute responsibility to act here. Thank you, Roger. And we're absolutely gonna dig more into the, the risks to democracy. Um, but first, I want to give Fema a chance to share her thoughts on the role of scale in relation to mis and disinformation and also react to your comments. Yeah, so I'll attack the oversight board first. Um, and I always speak plainly, so uh, forgive me for that. Uh, the Facebook oversight board is a joke. <laughs> If Facebook really cared about oversight, we have actually a capitalist mechanism for that, a, a board, the board of Facebook, uh, but Mark has made it such that they have absolutely no control. Unlike most corporate boards in the country, this board does not have the majority voting power. He does. If he was someone who actually cared about this, instead of the tens of millions of dollars that were poured into this board of folks who are handpicked by Facebook and are being paid by Facebook to act as though, and I don't speak to the individuals on the board and their intentions. I believe that they're people who actually care about cleaning up the internet and about doing better, but that's not what their role is. And so we shouldn't pretend that it is in any conversation that we're having. Um, it's a PR push 
by Facebook. And what, where I think we will start to see real action is if majority voting power is removed from the one individual who is making every single decision at Facebook and who has a financial interest in the company. Uh, so putting that aside, uh, for scale, these issues, I mean, I've been everywhere from, and the three companies I've been at are all relatively large, but I've been at Google. I've also been at Pinterest before it went public and when it was still technically a startup. Uh, the scale isn't necessarily the issue if you never prioritize safety. Safety is almost never prioritized at these companies, whether they're at the 50 employee mark or whether they have 50,000 or 250,000 employees that Google has. And so what you're doing is taking issues that just aren't noticed as much because the company is a little bit smaller. And then when there's rapid growth in, the case, in a case of a place like TikTok, then you start seeing large segments of the population who are complaining because of the harm that they're facing day to day. And so uh, to wait until you are expanding to different countries is too late. The, there needs to really be a focus on ethics and on values taught both uh, to the folks who join these teams to do sales and to expand their presence in other companies, to the engineers who are working on products and aren't um, approaching every single product surface with a safety lens. So whether it's messaging and thinking about the way that kids are groomed through messaging on almost all of these platforms, or whether you're looking at recommendations and what you're forcing into people's feeds, whether or not they're interested in it, there has to be thoughtfulness around every single product surface. And I haven't been at a single company where that has been the case. Elizabeth, can I follow up on this? Because I think Ifoma just made a really, really, really essential point. Please, please jump in, Roger. Yeah. So the, the United States has a culture in business that the shareholder is the only stakeholder that matters. And if you think about it, if, you're, if you only care about one of your stakeholders. So if you don't care about employees, you don't care about the communities where employees live, you don't care about customers or suppliers or in, or you know the country you live in. That's going to excuse all manner of bad behavior. It's a little bit like the classic issue of I was just following orders. So that's nationwide. In this sector, you have a special problem, which is something called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, passed in 1996 in order to get the internet, the World Wide Web, off the ground. And it effectively has been interpreted by courts as a blanket immunity. And so if you think about this, there is no incentive economically at these companies to anticipate or mitigate harm. Everything they do is thought of in terms of, of speed to market and maximum scale. So eliminating friction is their goal. The problem is there are a lot of places in life where friction is absolutely essential. And if you think about it, democracy and self-determination have lots of friction points built in. Procreation has friction built in. There are lots of times when friction is a really good thing, but culturally these companies eliminate it because they have both an economic imperative to do so and a cultural imperative. And this is something that is relatively new to Silicon Valley, something post 2000, uh, a very ch major change. And we could go into that, but it's, it's a topic for another day. But the essential thing here is that it never occurs to these companies to anticipate or mitigate harm. And that once you get to any kind of scale at all, architecturally, it's too late. This is the sort of thing you have to build in in your basic foundation. You have to think about protecting all communities. And if you look at it on a platform like Facebook, the challenge is that the number of harm parties represent a majority of the population. It's just that their experience of this is isolated in a way that prevents them from coming together to do something about it. And on that point, uh, I wanna dive a little deeper into the specifics. So. If I know you had experience dealing with vaccine related misinformation in your role at Pinterest, and that you're really concerned about the proliferation of health related misinformation specifically 
So I'd love for you to tell us more about how you handled mis uh, misinformation at Pinterest and how you think we need to address this going forward, because the problem, of course, is not going away. Um, and we'd also love to hear why you believe health-related misinformation is particularly problematic or give us any examples of the specific harms that you've seen result. Yeah, so health misinformation, and I like to say this uh, basically in every conversation where I talk about it, uh, is the OG of misinformation online. If you understand health misinformation, you will understand how to address political misinformation and whatever else you're seeing. But because of the communities it's traditionally harmed, there hasn't been a focus by these companies that are based in the U.S., Health misinformation from Ebola is still being trafficked online. Health misinformation from Zika is still being sent in WhatsApp groups. The reluctance, because it wasn't a U.S. first issue, and even when it was, so back in 2018 was when I started working on health misinformation um, issues at Pinterest and pushing them, and the angle that I took was, hey, you guys say, and you guys being general counsel, the head of content safety, people who are in executive positions who like to overrule everyone else. The pitch I made to them was, oh, you think this isn't a platform where people talk about politics, so you don't want to address political misinformation because that's not our issue. We are a platform where health and wellness is one of the top three topics that people engage in, rife with health misinformation. So we need to address it because of the business case. With that, I was then able to get the opening to address issues like political misinformation. And there's such a large overlap that's really focused on. Uh, as an example, Alex Jones uh, is uh, just a hateful human being but also traffics and political conspiracies, political misinformation. But what a lot of people don't focus on with his content and how dangerous it is, is he makes most of his money off of selling BS supplements and other health misinformation issues that he traffics in. And that's his revenue generator. You have to address one to address the other. And going to uh, the things that we've already discussed today, the lack of focus on the communities that are being harmed then ultimately results in us being harmed as well here in the US because the exact same types of misinformation that were used around Ebola and around Zika, we saw around measles uh, a year before COVID when there were huge outbreaks in uh, New York and in Washington state and in California and we're seeing the exact same things recycled with COVID. So Elizabeth, this, this is such a key point. The platforms profit enormously from these scams, right? Stop the Steal was a $200 million piece of business in a very short period of time. I mean, $200 million of fundraising to Trump, but you know, some significant piece of that stuck to platforms. And each one of these people, like Alex Jones, remember, YouTube alone recommended Alex Jones 15 billion times, I think, over two years. And, you know, which was greater than the sum of the reach of, like, all traditional news media put together. And that was just one guy, one platform. And he monetized all of that, you know, with these supplements. And that... That scam, that grift is actually a surprisingly large part of the revenue. I've had a really hard time figuring out what percentage of it is, but it, it you know, there, there's so much of it that it's definitely going to, I'm, I'm almost certain it's material, which is say above 5%. And, you know, if you add in things like the sale of exotic animals or uh, illegally stolen uh, artifacts and things like that, these platforms are unpatrolled economic systems that spread harm and then profit from it directly. So whatever claim they may have to, gosh, we didn't know, is it's just, it should be dismissed out of hand. I mean, the level of corruption here is sadly really extreme. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on that. So um, to the point that we didn't heed health related misinformation, you know, from other countries, we didn't learn from other contexts. There are many examples of how that's also true with threats to democracy itself. Um, so Roger, I'd like to dive a bit deeper into 
uh, how specifically mis- and disinformation threaten democracy from its institutions and processes and the values that you spoke about earlier. If you could give us concrete examples, perhaps, of some of the word, warnings that went unheeded or the lessons that, that we have learned so far or haven't learned so far. Well, to me, we live in a time where there are genuine conspiracies in the world. Think about Boeing. First, you had the 737 MAX. Nobody got punished. The CEO leaves, but he got a payout of like $67 million. Then they have the fires and the 777 engines. No accountability. The banking industry after 2008, right? They destroy the global economy. Nobody gets punished. So you live in an environment where, where conspiracy theories are more plausible simply because the real conspiracies that are actually out there that are undeniable. And so we live in a time of great uncertainty, great anxiety, where in the United States it's all compounded by the fact that there's a very large percent of the population, the working population, that is employment insecure. There's a sad percentage that is housing and food insecure. And this includes a disproportionate number of children. And then because we have employer paid health care, the pandemic just aggravates everything. And so you throw all that together going into the 2020 election in the United States, and you had a situation where the nexus between Trump and particularly Facebook, but also Twitter and Google, uh, in terms of spreading disinformation about the pandemic and picking up what I would describe as inartful statements from the medical profession about masks in the early days and social distancing, where we create a false dichotomy between the economy and public health, where you ha your choice, you get one or the other, as though the two are not linked. All of that was there. And, you know, sadly, our legitimate media played a huge role. They, they continued to view Trump as an economic opportunity and in many ways contributed to making the situation worse. And so I look at this as we don't know the exact number, but there are thousands of people who have died of COVID, convinced it was a hoax. But the U.S. numbers, more than half a million, really stand out as a staggering failure of leadership. But that failure was executed with disinformation in an election year. And there is still a terrifying percentage of the population that believes the election was wrongfully decided. And notwithstanding 61 legal cases, dozens of hand recounts. I mean, it's just, the whole thing is insane. You cannot run a democracy without a shared set of facts. I mean, in democracy, it's really about bringing different value systems to bear on a common set of facts. So you can, you can see them and prioritize them differently. But if one side denies the reality that the other side is living in, or if both sides deny the other side's reality, that is really a showstopper. And if you look, this is contagious. It goes on around the world because sadly, it's, you know, internet platforms and media companies behave very similarly in every jurisdiction around the world. And so the knock on effects each time one of these things happens, extremists learn something from, you know, other countries and apply it. And the platforms are happy to accommodate because it is core to their business model. Their business is attention. In order to get attention, they need to provoke us emotionally. And the best way to do that, sadly, the algorithms are going to find the stuff that provokes us most. And the stuff that triggers flight or fight, you know, the things we can't help but react to, so hate speech, disinformation, conspiracy theories, the algorithms are going to naturally promote them. And unless you take great care, that's going to just continue to spiral out of control. And here in the United States, you know, we're running out of time to fix this problem. Picking up on what you just said, Roger, so we've got a mix of a climate and a time of uncertainty, anxiety, instability, and security, and we're bringing that together with large dominant global companies that are driven by values like growth, efficiency, and scale. Um, bearing that in mind, I want to ask, you know, in your direct experience, particularly at FOMA, 
to what extent are tools having to do with things like automation, prediction, and persuasion uh, relevant here in terms of exacerbating the problem? And are there perhaps other root causes that we haven't considered that we should? They're entirely relevant. And I think uh, this is where it's important to mention the work of uh, AI ethicists like Dr. Timney Gebru who was pushed out of Google. Her um, colleague, Margaret, Margaret Mitchell, also pushed out of Google for raising exactly these issues. We, we have companies who, just like in the case of Facebook's uh, oversight board, the companies pay to set up these uh, shrines to ethicism and doing the right thing. And then as soon as anyone actually tries to do the right thing, uh, they get forced out. Uh, and those are the cases that we know about. The uh, work that I'm doing right now in California uh, to reform non-disclosure and non-disparagement agreements that bar people from talking about discrimination, harassment, and other workplace abuses that they experience is because we don't hear about 99% of the cases where someone has tried to raise things. They try to do the right thing, go through the company process, raise that, um, a machine learning system that they know of is biased in X way, the company doesn't want to hear it. And so they're pushed out and forced to sign an agreement where they can't ever talk about it. Uh, we need to know more to be able to hold these companies accountable. And they have done their darndest to make sure that we have no idea what's actually going on. Uh, and it's not enough to have the work, even though the work of researchers like Joan Donovan is incredible, she doesn't have access to all of the information that she needs because the companies make sure that they don't give it out to anyone. And when they do give out little bits, they give it to a few people who are at institutions that they want to cover it in a way that legitimizes the work. Um, so automation, it has everything to do with it. Um, and part of the issue is we don't have any sort of consensus across the industry as a whole about what it means to put safety first and to design with safety in mind. There have been programs at numbers of companies that I've heard of uh, that are called safety by design, but there's no tie-in to actual performance for the folks who are doing the work. So there's no incentive other than whether other than them naturally caring about safety to do the work. And then for lots of folks, because their actual performance is based on metrics like growth and scale, then they're penalized if they focus on safety instead of focusing on the things that their manager and their manager's manager have decided they're going to be rated on. So we just don't have a system where anyone is in a position um, where they're rewarded, let alone protected, if they focus on safety. Yeah, Elizabeth, one of the big problems here is that there is a cost to safety. It's inconceivable that Facebook and Google and Twitter would be as large and profitable as they are if they weren't doing all this harm. And, you know, as long as optimizing for the shareholder is the prime directive, it's going to be really hard to fix this. And which is why I think we need regulation and why we need to have, you know, regulation that doesn't just manage current behaviors, but in fact prohibits whole classes of activities that are standard today. Thank you both. I mean, I think one of the things your comments are really highlighting is how much things like mis and disinformation are symptomatic of much deeper yeah. uh, root causes of the problem. Um, you know, I also think that the work Yifoma, you're doing and you preempted my question around the brilliant legislative reforms that you're pursuing feels directly tied to this point about, you know, if the shareholder is the only stakeholder. Um, at the, and I also think about the, the smaller, the private companies where, you know, there isn't even that level of potential accountability. Um, so, you know, Roger, you alluded to uh, the types of regulations or reforms we might need um, you know, if you had some magical superpowers to make Congress act as you wish, how would you instruct them to act? My God, if I had a superpower, I would bring my dear friend uh, Shoshana Zuboff down to Washington and we would we would do some serious work. The first thing that I would do is I would ban surveillance capitalism. This whole notion of that 
every time we use an digital system, we leave a little footprint behind. The notion that that is now the property of any company that touches it and they can commercialize and exploit it any way they like, that has got to stop. I mean, the notion that health information, location and browser history are things which are incredibly intimate. The notion of commercializing that stuff is just plain wrong. And, you know, so we need to have a, a, a focus on privacy as something that's really about self-determination. It's really about personal autonomy. And at a bare minimum, we need to block certain classes of content like health, like location, like browser history, and then have opt-in for everything else so that the burden is on corporations to get your approval to use your data. But we also need to have a change in incentives. We need safety. And we need safety to be built in from the ground up. It needs to be foundational. And in order to do that, you have to have some kind of accountability. Fortunately, there's lots of history about this. In the building trades, in the pharmaceutical industry, in the chemicals industry, we face this exact problem. Industries that were inherently important to the economy, but dangerous to people. And we try different things. And I like the one from the building trades because there people sign up for a building code, which in this case, in the engineering sense, would be uh, something that was like a, uh, a duty of care that required you affirmatively to anticipate and mitigate harm before shipping any product. And that if you failed to do so, there would be corporate penalties, there would be executive penalties, and there would be individual penalties. And I think for the first two, they would be financial. For the exec- for the um, engineers, you would get demerits on something that was publicly available. So you could see who had participated in bad things. The third thing we need to do is we need to restore competition. And you know, antitrust law is an important tool for buying time. And it doesn't solve any problems, but it does buy time. And that's the place we're furthest ahead right now. And the most important is a case in Texas because it relates to alleged price fixing between Google and Facebook. If the federal government pursues that, they can pursue it as a criminal case. If they do so, it carries a three-year jail sentence. And I'm not in favor of putting people in jail, but I am in favor of using the threat of a jail sentence as leverage to get, you know, a better set of outcomes. So that's what I would do in my perfect world. So we're going to have to turn to the audience Q&A in a second, but if I might want to give you a chance to share your, your top recommendations or react to Roger. Yeah, my focus right now is on building worker power. I think at the root of this, a lot of the issues that we have in the tech industry and beyond, of course, are because there are no real worker protections in the United States. We need, they're always going, no matter what regulations you have, there will always be wrongdoing because human beings are running these companies and running these systems and you need the ability and you need incentives built in for people to do things like whistleblow. And so we need whistleblower protections akin to the kind that are moving through member states in the EU right now through the EU whistleblower whistleblower directive. We need the ability for folks when they see wrongdoing to be able to speak up not lose their health insurance. I recently wrote uh, a piece about exactly this issue that uh, in the case of me and my situation where I spoke up about wrongdoing that um, I experienced at Pinterest, the result of that was being pushed out of my job, losing my health insurance, and now I'm paying $900 a month for COBRA. How many people can have the ability to do that? I would not have had the ability to do that if I had dependents I was supporting. Like the, we just, we have a system right now in the middle of a pandemic where if you're an employee at Facebook, at Google, at Twitter, wherever else, and you see wrongdoing, you see consumer harms, you see uh, data privacy violations or whatever else, you have to decide whether it's worth speaking up and then stripping your family of health insurance in the middle of a pandemic. That's not right. And so no matter what other regulations we see, we need Congress to step up uh, and to provide protections to workers. And before that happens, we need state governments to do that. And so that's why I'm pushing the legislation I am in California. Yeah, thank you for that work. And we'll share resources um, after this event. Um, So I will turn to the the audience Q&A as promised, slightly behind schedule. 
So, you know, Roger, you mentioned earlier that um, the people engage and um, accept a lot of a lot of what's out there because of things like convenience and ease and um, and that a lot of this is actually in high demand. Um, and so there's a question about to what extent the solutions involve some kind of paternalism um, and also whether we're already experiencing that kind of paternalism with all the nudging and behavioral engineering that takes place through the use of automated tools um, and some of the algorithms that you mentioned. Um, so if you could speak to this tension between you know, what people want or seemingly want and what we know may be good for things like democracy and competing values. Well, I, this is such an important question because people ask me, what can they do? And I think the most important thing to do now is to engage in our political system, in our political processes, because we're on the verge of losing the thing that has made the United States unique for 240 years, which was a political system where in theory, everyone could engage and their voice could be heard. We're on the edge of you know, essentially the United States was about five competing power uh, centers, right? You had big government, big business, big religion, you had big labor, and then you had the press. And beginning in 1980, unions were wiped out. The press has been wiped out. And the other three coalesce some of the time around the Republican Party. And so you have the situation where there are no, you know, we don't have the oppositional forces that you need to have a, a, uh, ineffective democracy, that the choke points are such that you can have minority rule. And the implications of that over time are very bad. And these platforms have played an accelerating role. They didn't create any of this, but boy, have they sped it up. And we're at this point now where we have to sit there and decide what kind of country do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world where our choices are dictated to us, either overtly or uh, in a way that's hidden? Or do we want to have control of our own lives? Do we want to live in a world where opportunity is available to everyone, where respect is available to everyone? Because in a world dominated by a handful of very large companies, the number of choices available to you will shrink. And, you know, so we're, it's a very delicate time. And I just think we all have to get engaged in whatever way suits us best, with the explicit understanding that if we choose not to, that is a choice. You know, it, um, Martin Luther King used to talk about silence of the good, right? That this notion that, you know, there are moments in time when you must raise your voice or the thing that is unattractive will happen because the silence of the good will effectively serve the interests of the bad. And we're at one of those moments And so when we're talking ethics, when we're talking values here, I think we're talking about the the core things. These are not like nice to have around the edges. And if you're a student at Notre Dame or if you're a faculty member, you're you're probably living a very good life. You're probably among the few in America where on balance things are really, really good. But for at least half the country, every day is a struggle day. And things are materially worse than they were 20 or 30 years ago for that cohort. And, you know, there are some things that are a lot better, but, you know, the, the, the dangers are very real. And I, I'm, I'm extremely nervous about it. And, you know, if you study the history of Europe in the 30s, you can see parallels that are terrifying. If I might, I can give you a chance to react. There's also a question that uh, you may want to take first from a faculty member here at Notre Dame about how we change into a culture of Silicon Valley um, and what role education plays um, there's also a question about how solutions like education scale, and whether they scale, and any other recommendations on, on culture. Yeah, I'll answer the culture and education question since I think Roger did a great job with the first one. Um, education is relative. You can educate people on being hateful. You can educate people on focusing on uh, growth and scale at the cost of safety. So education in and of itself, I don't think is a solution. And I think that there are many different ways to gain an education outside of um, the traditional four-year university structure and um, getting advanced degrees beyond that. Where I think there needs to be a focus is 
even earlier than the university level um, and primary education on, uh, on valuing individuals and valuing uh, the safety of communities. There hasn't been a focus, at least not in any of the education that I received or formal education that I received at least, on why it's important for people to be safe in order to promote democracy. We don't actually, we've never actually had a fully fledged democracy in this country, regardless of what people like to say um, about the US and put it on some sort of pedestal when a specific portion of the population has been suppressed historically, both in law and otherwise. Uh, and so what we're seeing is the vestiges of that hate and the vestiges of that suppression just playing themselves out on these platforms and in the companies where we're seeing issues. So uh, the, the companies definitely have issues and they have culture issues that need to be addressed. They're no different than at places like Goldman, um, at places like Chevron and wherever else in academia. I have friends who read uh, my story after it was published about what I experienced at Pinterest who are experiencing the same things teaching at Yale and teaching at Princeton and wherever else. So uh, we, we have as a society, a need to address these issues where there's a, the hyper focus on the tech industry is that the issues that exist in the offices in California and in Atlanta and wherever else are having an impact on communities in Myanmar, in Nigeria, in other countries. And so there's an acute need to address culture there. Yeah, it sounds like you're also touching on um, a lot of questions around power. Uh, and there is a question uh, in our Q&A around recommendations or suggestions for institutions with relative power like Notre Dame um, beyond just research and advocacy in terms of, you know, what we can do to combat some of this. Um, for example, there's a specific question about whether we should uh, divest from or stop using uh, products from Facebook and others. I stop using. I mean, we're in a situation right now where you don't have an, you don't have the choice because of the lack of competition. You actually do not have a choice with many of these products uh, and your ability to do your job uh, relying on being able to access a Google Doc or being able to respond to someone or even join Zoom. Um, and Zoom has its own issues. So, so I don't think divesting in that way is a way that universities can step, step up where I do think they can is in cutting uh, partnerships with these companies that legitimize what the companies are doing. I, I saw in all three companies uh, that I was at a uh, yearning to work with universities like Notre Dame and like other prestigious universities in order to legitimize bad behavior. And that's always a choice on behalf of both the institution of the university and individual researchers who agree to do partnerships with these companies where they're paid very well uh, in order to be able to use the university name and the credentials that come with it. Can I push back slightly on that? So I, it, it, so I look at this as if you're a student at Notre Dame, you're probably going to be borrowing a lot of money that's going to lock you into having to optimize your salary. It's going to cause you to make a set of choices. If you are the University of Notre Dame, Google's offering you email, they're offering you docs, they're offering you all this kind of stuff. You know, Zoom offers you all these things that are incredibly convenient, but lock you into this ecosystem where it gets very hard for you to have any impact. So between the students and their student loans, and their need to earn high incomes coming out. And the university's making choices about this. And frankly, this starts in elementary school with Chromebooks and Google Classroom. And, you know, it works its way all the way up. This system is so deeply entrenched that it's very easy to come to the conclusion that there's nothing we can do about it. I would argue that the opposite is true. I'll give you a simple example. If I were a student at Notre Dame today, the thing I'd want to figure out is how do I make an email equivalent of six? a thing where essentially no information leaks out 
of the, you know, that it's all kept very tightly. How do we move so that every app that matters processes on the phone or on your device, not in the cloud? These are really laudable, important architectural changes that could easily happen, but there is nobody pushing for it right now. And any university could do that. And I think pushing back on these guys and saying, I'm sorry, but I'm not taking your email. I'm not letting you scan anything. I'm not letting you scan. I mean, Google Docs is a terrible product. And, you know, we use it because it's free and or next to free, I guess, if you get an institutional thing. But it's like, I'm sorry. At some point, if we if we take their framing of absolutely everything as something we can't adjust, if we aren't willing to bear any inconvenience to fix this problem, we're doomed. And I just don't believe that's where we are. I think these are all human choices. We have agency. Let's use it. Let's accept a little less convenience. I gave up using Google products now more than three years ago. And it was a pain in the butt at the beginning. But, you know, as, as poor Nicole and, and Elizabeth will tell you, they had to send me a, a PDF because I refused to open a Google Doc. And I, that's a pain in the butt. But, you know, it's my own little protest. And if Notre Dame did that, It would get national attention and everybody else who makes alternative products would be all over you. Like, you know, like paint on a wall. Thanks Roger. Um, (laughs) We appreciate your patience with us on that front. Um, So I think we have time for about one or two more questions. Uh, And since you mentioned incentives and trade-offs, what role do investors play in all this? So we saw um, a lot of controversy uh, recently over clubhouse and over how, you know, we're 10, arguably 20 years into this conversation, and we're seeing many of the same uh, mistakes repeated. We're seeing, you know, sharing of contacts without consent. We're sharing, we're seeing dark patterns. Um, we're seeing, you know, sort of a very unclear business model. Um, how, do we, how do we incentivize investors um, to really care about things like ethics uh, embedded, not just in products and services, but also in companies and company culture. Are you asking me? I'm asking both of you, <laughs> whoever wants to go first. I just, the, the problem here is everything's optimized for the shareholder. So in, there's literally no incentive for investors to behave any way different than this. To me, the shocking thing about Clubhouse is how all the people who ought to know better flocked to it. I mean, everybody in the tech press flocked to it. And every, I mean, every activist in my world flocked to it. I mean, it's like, excuse me, it's so obviously broken, so obviously badly designed. Who cares that it's fun? At some level, if that's where we're going, I mean, read Neil Postman, read Aldous Huxley. I mean, if that's really where we are, if we're at the point where we just can't help ourselves, then Yvonne and I need to go find another line of work and another place to live because, you know, this isn't going to happen. I want to believe we're capable of act, actually, you know, having principles, having values and living by them and accepting that there is in fact some cost to that. I believe that that's actually a basis of religion. And, you know, I'm sort of sitting there thinking, I think that can be a basis of real life. And, you know, I'm not telling you how to live your life, but I'm suggesting you do have choices. None of this is inevitable. And, you know, it doesn't take a lot of people to make big change. I agree completely. Um, That said, I have participated in Clubhouse conversations and uh, listened to a few of them to get a sense of the kind of disinformation that is spreading on the platform. And it's dangerous. And I don't think any of it is a mistake. And I think characterizing any of their practices as the mistake uh, is far too generous. And so... So that's what I'll say. The investors who are part of it are completely aware of what's going on and are encouraging it. Uh, And they're basically going to continue because there are no real consequences. We don't have a functioning FTC that is actually levying the types of fines uh, that would discourage this type of behavior. We don't have 
we don't have any uh, institutional ability for those who are working at Clubhouse right now to be able to raise a flag and say, hey, this thing is going on. I raised it internally. Nothing is being done about it. What can we do from a regulatory standpoint? Um, so I, I, I don't know what the answer is for the investor side and the VC side. Uh, what I'll say about shareholders is there are a few shareholder groups who have tried to, um, to levy their own consequences through shareholder lawsuits. There's one that's suing Pinterest uh, using my disclosures and that of other uh, former colleagues. There, that same one in Rhode Island, I think, is suing Facebook right now. Uh, and is getting some way there. But again, because of the board structures for, um, for Facebook, Mark still retains all of the control, regardless of whether every single other board member voted against what he wanted to do. Uh, in the case of Pinterest, which, uh, which set up its board structure copying Facebook's, not only does Ben Silverman, the CEO, retain majority control after he dies, his family does for a portion of time. Like there's just absolutely no common sense in having a system like that because there's no incentive, no consequences in place for bad behavior. And so where I think that investors, again, there's no incentive for them to do so, but if they are good human beings and care to, uh, can uh, make clear that there should be some more equity in the system is right at the beginning, forcing founders to understand that you may have started a company, but at the point at which you start accepting investments, it is not just your company and you cannot have a structure in place where you retain control regardless of what you do and regardless of what happens. Thank you both. Um, so we're just about out of time. I want to thank you both so much for joining us. I, I know I personally have learned a lot and have really enjoyed the conversation. Um, we'll share materials and, and hope that everyone, you know, goes and sees all the amazing work that you're doing. Um, so thank you again, Roger Nifoma. This was brilliant. Um, we also want to let everyone know that our third Tech Talk is coming up on March 22nd. We'll have uh, Danielle Citron from the University of Virginia and Yale Eisenstadt as well joining us to talk about platform responsibility for online speech. So um, we hope you'll all register and join us for that one as well and check out the whole series um, of Tech Talks at Think ND. Um, and thank you again to our brilliant guests. Uh, we're so honored to have you. This uh, recording will be shared once it's, once it's ready. Um, and you can see that on our uh, Twitter feed at Tech Ethics Lab. And we'll also be emailing the group. So thanks again to everyone. Um, we hope you enjoyed it and uh, we hope you have a good day. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. And good thank luck you. next time. That'll be great, Danielle and Yael. Wow. Should be good. Thanks everyone. <laughs>